a pleasure of a fun fact. What was that again, please? A pleasure of a fun fact. Fun fact. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, well, I'm really uh, glad to be here, and uh, thank you for having me. I uh, I went to school in Berlin, so, uh, you know, it was nice to uh, chat with Berliners about how we love Berlin. And, uh, Great. So, um, yeah, so I'm with ARF now, and uh, we uh, already heard a little bit about the ARF's involvement here. Uh, these are these presentations that we had actually makes it very easy for me because you now have uh, kind of background that explains all of this. <clears throat> I think most of you are familiar somewhat with the ERF, but just uh, in case uh, we were founded in '36, so we've been around. We're New York based, but the membership is global. We have about 400 uh, corporate members. And what's really unique about the ARF compared with other organizations that we have a membership that uh, brings together people with all these different backgrounds, uh, marketers, ad agencies, media companies, including the new uh, tech platforms, research companies, and even have associations and academics. Uh, more recently, we uh, have connected with two other organizations. The MSI is the Marketing Science Institute, which is primarily um, academics who do applied research, and SIM, the Coalition for Innovative Media Measurement, which was actually founded for my, uh, by my boss at uh, NBC uh, about a decade ago. Uh, and they're both part of the uh, ARF. Uh, the uh, uh, Coalition for Media Measurement is very much focused on uh, media measurement. Um, we are different, uh, and, and uh, Michael asked me earlier from the uh, uh, MRC, uh, the, uh, which is focused on um, evaluating and accrediting services. Our mission is a little bit different, um, as you see here, and this hasn't really changed very much since 1936, uh, is to further through research the scientific practice of advertising and marketing. So since we heard so much about science here, you know that I'm in the right place here. Uh, so uh, our claim to fame is that we really try to be independent. They will really, really try very hard to be imp uh, impartial and uh, to be objective. And so that brings me to this uh, to this uh, new project, which uh, we uh, started formulating this uh, this fall, and is really based on this growing interest in attention metrics, as well as the growing market uh, for attention metrics. So what happened is that ARF members, and this is quite typical, they come to us and they say, well, you know, we really should uh, take a look at this and we really want somebody who's independent, objective, and to review the methods and the evidence. We hear a lot from the vendors, you know, and they sometimes contradict uh, each other. So we really love to get some transparency on this. And hopefully we'll, you'll have some uh, best practice recommendations for us. Now, this is very, very similar to something we did when I first started it, uh, as ARF. Uh, we called it Neural Standards in 2011. It was a very, very similar process. Um, members came to us and said, you know, all these guys are coming to us. They have this neural stuff and they look into people's brain and they have these methods that we never heard about. Uh, you know, they look into the brain and do all kinds of wild things, and they say it's like the best thing ever, and it will solve all our problems. So why don't you take a look at that? So uh, a little bit of that uh, uh, experience um, was helpful for us to formulate this uh, project, and we uh, have sort of devised uh, three phases. Phase one is going on right now. We call it the market atlas, and in a second, I'll, I'll explain a little bit further. Second is a study of uh, creative uh, testing applications. And third would be a study of media uh, evaluation applications. And, and this is sort of our timeline, uh, which we hope to be able to adhere to. Okay, mark, Market Atlas. That has actually started. Uh, in fact, uh, our friends here have actually are actually participants. And I understand that they have devoted some of their very, very valuable time to uh, responding to us and in the process of providing these kind of data. Uh, so what are we looking at here? We want it's primarily a descriptive catalog of the current uh, vendor space. 
And it's based on the survey, and we're going to have some follow-up interviews. Um, so what are we looking for here? And it's really uh, all the things that have already been addressed in the uh, presentations uh, uh, that we heard earlier this morning. Uh, we want to hear about the use cases, about the products and services offered. But very importantly, we also want to hear the definitions and theoretical underpinnings of the whole concept of attention measurement. And we had some really, really great discussions on that already. Uh, I, I think that in the in the uh, space today, we sort of see a range. Um, like today, we heard a lot of really, I would almost say philosophical, uh, deep explorations uh, about what is attention all about? What does it mean uh, to a human being? What does it mean in the advertising world? Whereas on the other hand, we have talked to some people who are saying, well, you know, we are, we are not really that concerned about that, but we have a case study showing that our uh, attention measurement had a, had a big, big effect. So there's less concern uh, about uh, these uh, underpinnings. Uh, so I think we'll have some interesting differences there. And then of course, um, we have different uh, measurement methods and, and Max just sort of described, uh, I think a very interesting process on how two companies are getting together and using two uh, methodologies, combining them and creating something new and uh, hopefully uh, better than, uh, than the uh, previous uh, uh, approaches that were used. Uh, we wanna hear about the analytical methods. We wanna see validation studies and white papers. Um, so what we expect to come out of all of that, the insights that we hope to get is, number one, how do the various um, vendors define attention and how do they measure it? And we think there's going to be a link. We're going to expect to find a link between the definition and the measurement. And, uh, you know, we saw that. Uh, very clearly in Max's presentation where he focused on visual attention. And I think you weren't that explicit about it, but I think uh, the underlying assumption here that visual attention, ignoring audio, is actually a very successful, valuable way to approach this issue. And we, you know, can discuss it a little bit more later. So um, what are the uh, definitions based on? And again, something that Max just explained really, really well is that to, sometimes it's the measures are through direct human observation, but they can also be impression proxies. And actually, full credit, I took the word uh, impression proxies from a paper that Max wrote that was uh, uh, published in, in a walk newsletter. And I said, yeah, that's the term I was looking for. So I put it right in there. So thank you for that. And then of course, <laughs> then of course the role of AI, which is like a huge topic and, and of great interest to everybody. The second question then is how are attention metrics used? And again, uh, you see, um, you saw earlier, there are two main applications. One is to optimize creative and the other one to optimize media placement. And we wanna get a better idea who does what, you know, what is the uh, most often used uh, application of these metrics in the marketplace today. And then uh, the third point, and that's something that's very close to the heart of the uh, AR, AR, uh, ARF, as you can uh, you know, imagine from our mission. And that is, and even the name that we gave to the project, how much validation evidence is there? Um, what is the uh, uh, validation uh, um, evidence? And we wanna look at the validation of inputs, uh, with regard to the measurement itself, but then also uh, to outcomes uh, uh, in the marketplace. Uh, it would be very interesting to see uh, what was available, purchase data, in purchase intent, rent imagery, all of these different uh, uh, outcomes uh, probably have been uh, used in various studies. So again, we wanna uh, look at all of those things. And I thought this was gonna be a little bit of an advertisement, but uh, I see that uh, uh, the uh, uh, conference has already been promoted heavily earlier because uh, uh, we have uh, several people here who will present 
uh, and for those who are not that familiar with ARF, so this is our uh, annual conference. Uh, in the fall, uh, winter, we have a paper competition. So this year we got 116 submissions, but at the conference itself, we have room for about 30. So we have a bunch of um, uh, evaluators, uh, uh, members, uh, ARF, uh, ARF research uh, department, and so on. And all this, all the evaluations are being um, scored and uh, ranked, and we have discussions. And uh, sometimes we go back to the uh, our submitter and say, "Look, we really like your paper, but this one thing we recommend changing." Very often, it's could you just be a little bit less promotional? Uh, so um, their papers were accepted, which again is is really really uh, great considering you know this this big competition there. Uh, and we're very, very excited that we got so many really good papers. It's a two-day conference, April 25, April 26. And on the 26th, that's the day where we, which is like the half of the day is devoted to attention. So there are going to be like six, seven papers or so. And afterwards, all the people who submitted papers are going to have a discussion. And I think... Uh, uh, I suggested that in our agenda, we use the term, there will be a lively discussion. Why do you think it's going to be lively? Well, one of the papers that was accepted claims that facial recognition really is not a good measure that doesn't really work very well to measure attention. Other papers, of course, use facial coding. We also are going to have somebody who says, you shouldn't be measuring attention. It's just too complicated. You should measure inattention. So I think we're going to have a number of uh, different points of view. And so uh, we're looking forward to this uh, discussion. And I, you know, all jokes and so uh, aside, I, I really think that that's going to be so important because that's what we really need. We need people to share information, look at, look at the uh, presentation that other people have prepared and say, okay, so is this true? What is right? What is wrong here? And so on. And that, I think, is really going to bring us forward. So hopefully we'll see some of you there. All right. So that's the spring. Uh, phase two would be the assessment of creative testing applications. So this is going to be a empirical research project. And again, it's patterned after the neural standards where we did the same thing we did in original study. What will that look like? Well, we plan to assemble a set of common creative assets contributed by participating brands, and then have the vendors who take part in this uh, test the common creative assets. And by the way, I see Michael making lots of comments here. In case they're about the presentation, of course, you have, you, everybody can have access to the presentation when they take another look. Um, so uh, the, uh, uh, all the vendors are going to uh, look at, uh, test these uh, creative assets, and we're going to look at the results and, and see to what degree is their convergence, to what degree is their divergence. Um, and I think this is really going to help us to get insights on the uh, pros and cons of the of the uh, various applications. And then we plan to uh, issue a report on learnings uh, for for the industry. Now, phase three is going to be a lot uh, going to be a lot trickier because this is a very complex and difficult research issue. How is attention? How is attention being used to optimize media? How can you research that? Well, we're still uh, thinking about that and we are getting input from academic and industry advisors and, uh, and project participants on that. And we plan to have lots of discussions on that to uh, really come up with a good uh, uh, approach. Possibilities include an in-market life test which could be very, very expensive and very, very tricky. Um, we would we'll uh, uh, test actual campaigns and run across multiple, uh, multiple vendors. Um, one of the problems you know, with all of this is, what are you testing? Do you test how many categories? Do you just take, use auto? Do you, you really want to have a, a range of categories. 
So if you think about that, you know, before you know it, you have 100 cells. Um, the other possibility is sort of a retrospective uh, reanalysis or replication of common and overlapping cases in, in the vendor's archives. So that's a little bit uh, further down the road. It is kind of important because I think we do expect that optimizing uh, media environments is one of the uh, you know frequent applications of this research. So it would be very important to uh, look at that. So to sum up, our goals are really to improve market understanding of attention measurement, to assess replicability, reliability, and validity of existing approaches and methods, and propose step to improve research and application practice. So obviously the uh, uh, premise here is that things are not perfect and could be improved, but hopefully you agree there's always room for improvement. And so that's what we're after. So um, pun intended, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I didn't use my full time, but then of course, uh, uh, lunch is beckoning but I, uh, I'd certainly be more than happy to engage uh, with you with questions, uh, comments, suggestions, complaints. <laughs> Thank you so much, Horst, for the presentation. Um, any questions? Anybody has any questions? I just had a question. Where does currency fit into that last slide? When you talk about assessing and replicating approaches to attention and to measurement, where does currency fit? I mean, is it a question of, how is it being measured today? Can there be some normalization of the measurement? Are you asking if we think uh, attention could be a currency? Is that yes. your question? Yes. Well, it's a th that's a really, really interesting, uh, you know, interesting point. Uh, some of the vendors, you know, are striving for that. I don't think we, we would want to go there uh, because currency in currencies inherently are not scientific judgments. They're not about really about science. They're really about negotiations. They're really about whether, <clears throat> whether buyers and seller agree on specific methods that they use for, 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 for trading. And um, you know, very often uh, MRC accreditation is an important element in that. But uh, I think that uh, we would we would have the perspective that you need a lot of validity evidence in order to recommend something uh, as a cur to use something as a currency. But uh, the ARF does not make that recommendation, as I said, because you know we we, we think that that's not our our mission. Our mission is to provide information to the marketplace about the uh, validity, about the pros and cons, to give them recommendations uh, with regard to best practices. And then they can go sit together and decide how they wanna, which measurement they wanna use and what the currency should be. My feeling about what's going on in the industry right now is that, you know, since I've been around for so long, during this entire time that I was at, uh, at uh, NDC, the only issue always was, why is Nielsen so expensive and could the ratings be better? And if the ratings don't favor us, let's complain. Nobody even thought about having a alternative kind of currency. There was an attempt to compete with Nielsen, but not in this kind of different way. The whole issue about involvement, engagement, and tension has been around for you know, 50 years in the industry, but they were also seen as a qualitative enhancement. But what's happening now is that I think most people in the industry accept the fact that beyond simple exposure, there are now measurements that allow you to go beyond exposure and ask, well, was it intense exposure? Was it attentive exposure? Did it create emotional resonance and so on? And wow, that's better than simple exposure. So let's think about that as a secondary currency. And I think that different companies will choose different methods, quite frankly, probably based on which ones they think really favor their particular environment. 
uh, you know, you could see that if if I was still with uh, television, I would probably think, well, the one thing where television seems to excel is people look at the ads for longer time periods than they do on any other medium. So let's see if we can do something with that. So that's a long answer to your question. Uh, Sorry, Max. I was going to make a comment on that. It, yeah. It seems like the uh, media industry is in a sort of a hangover where currency kind of meant monopoly. Yeah. Sort of implied. But having talked to all those companies up there and partnering with most of them on the boards that I showed earlier, um, yeah, I mean, anyone would love currency because it's like, you know, you're the boss. But but the, what we see actually happening is when adoption comes, you see, uh, the, the, maybe currencies will come, but what we see happening right now is steps toward arbitrage. Using yeah, attention yeah. metrics for our, using attention metrics for arbitrage uh -huh. to to drive to drive better price and look performance. Mm -hmm. so. And and one thing which I think was really interesting in in Max presentation that you pointed to that attention in different media and different platforms has to, means different things and has different impact, which I think again from the perspective of a content provider leads you right back to the point that I was just trying to make is so which measurement kind of is really good for me, perfect for me, will enhance my measurement and show me in a positive light rather than a one size fits all. Thank you, Horst, for the presentation. Oh, one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, just to elaborate a little bit more and uh, uh, I mean, for, for I Square, since we are not in the capitalistic business, we, we wouldn't like to be the currency, of course. For us, it's a different thing, but everybody would like to be, that's, that's for sure. Uh, but may I ask you a little bit more on a, on a broader scale? Do you feel there's an issue with the currencies? I mean, like in Europe, there's also a big political discussion that kind of the currency is going... It doesn't the current the current currencies. I mean, outside the classical media, they are different. But in the digital, there's there's a point made that these currencies neglect the content and neglect the creativity. So this is the story. The the dollar to make it very simple. The, the dollar goes to uh, uh, the dollar goes to uh, to Google, and uh, there the dollar stays. And it is not where it should be at the content producer. Would you feel a little bit the same? Is there a discussion? Would another currency kind of help here or not? Or well, again, why does it have to be a currency? Because again, the currency, the way I I would define it, is a agreement on buying and selling, which typically is a compromise. Um, and if I interpret your presentation and the approach that your company is, presents, I don't think that compromise is in the center. I, I think excellence is the center of what you're pursuing. So I think you would want to provide the deepest, most valuable, most accurate, most valid insights to your clients, and then have them make decisions based on that accurate information. But in a currency debate, I think what very often happens is that what wins out is the most scalable, affordable, and that measurement that sort of pleases both sides. One you know, one of the key examples is and, um, in when, uh, when Max was showing earlier, the percentage of impact that, uh, according to his research, comes from the media and it comes from advertising. Uh, it comes from, uh, from the creative, okay? And I think the, the research from 20 years ago favored creative much more. It showed that creative had a much bigger impact than uh, 40 or 50%. And I think the reason is because that research was based practically only on television. So if you look at only on only a television, 
then what you're measuring is the impact of the creative and the context effects that come from the different kind of programming. So in that environment, the context effects really are quite small. But now, if you look at television and all the social media and all these different other platforms, so suddenly those, the impact of those platforms gets much, much bigger and much more relevant. So, and I think there's been a, a learning process. And I think we're probably still in that learning process as the media develops so quickly. Because like in the digital area, click-through used to be sort of a currency until yeah, people yeah. realized that it was crap, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think yeah, yeah. that, again, is a process that's, uh, that's ongoing. So I would you know, predict that there would be, there could be a lot of changes. And of course, the other side of that is there seem to be a lot of opportunities. And uh, so does that sort of go and partially answer your question? All right. Oh, one more. Yeah, yes. Uh, I have a realize in more recent uh, I swear I'm not personally familiar with ARF, so it's really interesting to hear your more impartial view of right. Not every attention measurement is fit for everyone. How do you go about identifying what are the strongest metrics in the space? I know you had some slides up about scalability and validation, um, but when you're looking at a Realize versus say any other emotional competitors out there, we've decided Realize is the best and works for our company, but I know there are other options. <laughs> um, so I guess, what is your evaluation process like when new players come on? Yeah, I, I mean, I could go back on the slides, but I, 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 it goes back to what I was saying earlier, is that <clears throat> valid, validation of measurement. Uh, I think that we would we would look at replicability if you if you if you uh, test the same ad twice under the same circumstances do you end up with the same with the same uh, with the same uh, met with the same evidence the same numbers um, validation uh, in in the marketplace um, with regard to uh, does the stuff work is it predictive I, I think the market really, is focused on on that, <laughs> which is, is this a tool that helps me identify commercials or media environments that have a more positive effect uh, effect for me with a desired with a desired outcome, um, and um, and the uh, issue of scale, I think, is something that every company sort of has to decide for themselves. So here's one, here's one theory or one point of view. Uh, and I'll uh, be sort of vague on whether I agree with that or not. Um, if you want to find out which commercial is likely to have a bigger impact for your sales goals, you have a variety of methods at hand, right? And just to compare attention and neural measurement, well, I think all the people who are doing EEG and all this neuroscience measurement, I think would argue that they have the ability to get closer to the emotional measurement and people's brains and their reactions. And they have a lot of validation to show that. But they may have to do that in a lab. They may charge you $20,000 per commercial. And it will take a little bit, it's like a week. What was that? There you go. So there's another issue. So on a all these practical, practical uh, uh, considerations come in here. So I think what we are trying to do is just sort of help uh, our members to sort of sort all of this out and then have them, you know, make maybe make some recommendations uh, to uh, go back to this uh, neuro, uh, <clears throat> neuroscience uh, project. Uh, the recommendations we, were, we, went, we made then was a catalog, this, is what you should ask of your vendor. Exactly how do you measure? 
What is your validation evidence? Do you have, uh, you know, what is, what is the cost? Do you have, uh, you know, what is your validation evidence? Do you have clients who uh, want to give the, uh, <clears throat> who want to, you know, give their, uh, their evidence and, and, and uh, report on how they used you? And by the way, uh, when we have our paper competition for our conference at the ERF, uh, one thing we always say to uh, vendors is when you submit a paper, if you can include a client that really helps acceptance, because that means that somebody paid you and then was so happy with what you did that they're willing to be on stage with you and say, they did great stuff. We sold more because they helped us to do the right thing. And that's always, you know, really good evidence for, for quality research that really works in the marketplace. All right. Does everybody have appetite now? Or... <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I'll be around. I'm going to be around all day. So uh, if you if, if something comes to your mind, please correct me.